So not just the, not just the average, but also, um, there's a bit of echo there, um, but also, um, you know, fluctuations, higher moments, etc., full distributions. And it turns out that remarkable sort of symmetry relations um, hold in that context, whereby the fluctuations arbitrarily far from equilibrium of thermodynamic quantities are constrained by dissipation. So not just fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is essentially linear response result, but really at arbitrary orders in, in a sort of perturbation, okay? Um, and like many topics in thermodynamics, the quantum generalizations of those fluctuation theorems and thermodynamics in general lags behind the progress that's made classically, okay? That is just a fact. Um, so the generalizations of these fluctuation theorems, which I'll talk about, came later than the classical results. So the first two works that discuss the fluctuations of work, okay, thermodynamic work, were by Kirshan and uh, Tisaki. I, again, I can make a comprehensive um, literature sort of compilation. I just won't have time to write down every single paper. And these appeared around 2000. They're actually, neither of those papers are published. They're both on the archive for historical reasons. And then a few years later, there was a published paper by, by Hangi, Lutz, uh, Peter Talkner about work is not an observable, which I'll, I'm gonna discuss now, that sort of formalized it and tidied it up and that kind of thing. So let's go back to the original context of, um, that we started from. So this situation where, you know, you have this, um, you have this situation where you have some thermal equilibrium state in parameter space at lambda zero, a thermal equilibrium state at uh, lambda tau, okay? The work done along that isothermal path is delta F, and you decide to do um, some unitary process which, um, you know, um, evolves you up here. So that was the sort of first context that we, we discussed in the earlier lecture. Okay, so now the question is, we know what the average work is going from rho lambda zero to sigma, yeah? That's just the energy change. But uh, you might be tempted, for example, to define a work operator, yeah? So you might, be, you might be tempted to define work like this, define a work operator. So you might define something like this guy is going to be, you know, U dagger, um, H of uh, lambda, uh, whatever, zero, U dagger, sorry, lambda F should be lambda tau um, minus uh, H of lambda zero, just some operator, which is, and then you say, okay, well, I, I can define the average work as the trace of this thing on the initial state, rho uh, lambda zero. This might be something that you might be tempted to do. And that will indeed um, give you the correct result at the level of the first moment for the average work, right? But the issue is that this is not correct, and this was in this famous paper, which is work is not an observable by Hangi, Talkner, and Lutz. Um, this is incorrect because work defines a process, okay? It's not an operator. So how do we think about work from this perspective, and this leads us to the, so this is incorrect, right? So how, wh what do I mean, okay? I wanna talk about work statistics. So work statistics is built up in a two measurement scheme. So at t equal to zero, yeah, okay, Let's define the Hamiltonian again. So the, the Hamiltonian is going to be sum over n um, epsilon n lambda of t. Um, so this is a sort of adiabatic basis, okay? So you change the Hamiltonian in time, yeah? 
And um, you prepare a thermal equilibrium state at time zero, and the first step at time equal to zero is you're gonna projectively measure h lambda zero. Okay? So what does this give you? Yeah? This gives you an energy eigenvalue, E n lambda zero, okay? And because you've prepared a thermal equilibrium state, you get this eigenvalue, okay, with probability given by e to the minus beta E n lambda zero, okay, over z lambda zero. Now, what you're left with, of course, is you've measured the system projectively, so the state post-measurement is now projected, right, onto the energy eigenbasis of the initial Hamiltonian. Then you evolve according to the unitary, okay, and at the final time, right, you're going to, at t is equal to tau, you, you, you projectively measure h at lambda tau, okay? And this gives you some energy eigenvalue, lambda tau, which is different, okay, different set. So what is the probability now that you measure em lambda of tau? So of course, your measurement at time tau is conditioned on the outcome of your measurement at time zero. So you actually measure EM lambda tau, yeah, with a conditional probability, PM, given that you measured N, okay? And this is given by the transition matrix elements between EM lambda tau, U, E n lambda zero squared. So again, scenario is, for those people who haven't seen it before, okay, time zero, thermal state is prepared. You measure the energy eigenvalue, okay? You obtain that outcome with probability p n. You evolve the post-measurement state until time tau, and you measure again projectively onto the, new, onto the final basis. And you get EM tau, okay, EM lambda tau, with a probability that's conditioned on your first measurement. In a single run of this experiment, you define a stochastic variable, W, work, as EM lambda tau minus EN lambda zero. Okay? Stochastic variable, on one shot, you measure that. You record, you, prepare, you, you do the experiment again, and you get another value, and so on and so forth. So you build a probability distribution for the outcome W. Okay? So how does the probability distribution look? Okay? Well, the probability distribution for work is defined as sum over n, m, probability that you measure E n at lambda zero, the conditional probability that you measure n now, given that you measured n in the first instance, okay, delta w minus the stochastic variable, e m, sorry, epsilon m lambda tau minus e n lambda zero. And this is called the work distribution, okay? You build up the statistics of the measurements of the stochastic variable W over many runs of your experiment with an identical preparation, okay? And you do the same unitary, and then you get this stochastic outcome, build a probability distribution, and that that's what the probability distribution is. Of course, um, Pn, Pmn, is the joint probability by Bayes' theorem, okay? So, you can show now, this is, I leave it as an exercise, it's not too bad, that the average work, okay, namely the trace of sigma 
h lambda a tau, okay, which we defined in the first lecture, trace rho lambda zero uh, h lambda zero, is equal to the integral of w p of w dw. And you can also show that this is a well-normalized distribution, of course. So these are exercises, okay? What now is nice to do, because the work is defined as a probability distribution, this is the work statistics, is to try to think about the characteristic function of the work, okay? So the characteristic function of the work, and you could, it's an equivalent thing, okay? It's the basically defined like g of u is equal to integral of i to the u w p of w dw, okay? It's equivalent. So let's work through that, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna use p of w, which was sum over n m p n p m n delta w e m lambda tau minus e n lambda zero, okay? And we're just gonna do this integral, okay? To calculate the characteristic function, which is by definition defined like this, okay? Okay, um, let's sort of write it out, okay? So um, if I put this in here, okay, then, um, then well, the e to the i w with the delta function goes, so I guess g of u equal to sum over n m, I get e to the i u e m uh, lambda of tau, minus, sorry, epsilon, sorry, b is a bit thing, epsilon m. P m n, p n, okay, delta goes. So let's put in explicitly the expressions for p n and p a and the conditional probability p m n, okay? So this is equal to sum over n m e to the i u, E m lambda of tau minus E n lambda zero. And I'm just gonna write out explicitly the conditional probability. I get a u, I get an epsilon n lambda zero. I get an epsilon n lambda zero. I get a u dagger, and I get an e um, m lambda tau, okay? And then I also get, of course, multiplied by the initial probability pn. So this is just, this is just pn, and this is just the writing of pmn, okay? We're gonna manipulate that a little bit. Okay, so let's manipulate n m e uh, m lambda tau. I get a u e to the minus i u h lambda zero. I get um, get u, e, okay, I've brought that guy in, okay, I get epsilon n lambda zero, epsilon um, n lambda zero, u dagger, e to the i u h um, lambda tau, okay, I spotted now what thing, I get an E, sorry, epsilon uh, M lambda tau here. And uh, actually, 
I forgot I should have the initial state is here as well, okay? I brought that in and just turned it into a density matrix again, okay? Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to just bring um, the sum over n inside, okay? I'm gonna bring the sum over n inside there. So I get sum over n, yeah? Epsilon m lambda of tau, okay? U e to the minus i u h lambda zero, okay? Um, I get the initial state, which comes from the pn, okay? Lambda zero. I get a u dagger. I get an e to the i u h lambda zero. So this should be pn here, what am I doing? Where is pn? Because when I bring the sum in, yeah, I'm just getting the initial density matrix. Apologies, my mistake, okay? Um, U dagger, this is a lambda tau. And I get an epsilon m lambda tau. Just check if everything's fine. Yeah, that looks okay. So I've just brought the sum in, I've changed into the, um, I've changed the initial, I've, I've got the representation of the initial state in there, okay? And now I'm left with this expression. And this is a trace, right? So this is a trace. So I'm gonna do two steps. This is a trace. I'm gonna, because it's a trace, I can cycle around the unitary, okay? Sorry, I can cycle in the trace. And I get a U dagger e to the i u h lambda of tau u e to the minus i u h lambda zero rho lambda zero. Okay? And this is really nice, right? It's a nice expression. I mean, if you want, you can you can absorb the u's up into the exponent and say that h is in the Heisenberg picture, okay? But you can see that the characteristic function of the work, right, is essentially a two-point correlator in some sense, okay? Um, and, you know, you can use this expression. It can be handy for calculations because you can, you can calculate the moments from it because it's a characteristic function i u to the n all over n factorial uh, w to the n, okay? Where w to the n, the moments, are minus i to the n d n du, okay? g of u evaluated at u equal to zero, okay? It's just a characteristic function, I can always do that. And likewise, if you want to take the log of the characteristic function, you get the cumulant generating function, okay? So you get the cumulants of the distribution. Um, okay, now why, why did I go to, you know, why did I bother with this thing? What's interesting about it? There's a very elegant way that you can prove a fluctuation theorem directly from the characteristic function. Okay, that's what I'm going to do now, okay? So notice that I'm gonna take u and I'm gonna set it equal to i times beta, okay? So g of i beta, okay? What is this? This is the integral of e to the minus beta w, p of w, dw, okay? Which is equal to um, e to the minus beta w. Agree? I'm just substituting in i beta for u, okay? Now, let's do the same on the right-hand side. So I'm gonna put u equal to i beta here, okay? Into this one as well, yeah? So this is equal to, ah, it's gone? I didn't know. Well, let me, let me continue on the board then. Is it back? Yeah, but you don't like it. Yeah, it's okay, let me finish this part and I'll do the last bit on the board, it's fine. Okay, so. Okay, so what I'm doing, how, how much did you not see? Okay, fine. 
So, so look, all, I'm, all I've done here is I've substituted in i times beta into the definition of the characteristic function. This gives me back this object here, which is the average exponentiated work. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in on the right-hand side u is equal to i beta, right? So this is very similar for those of people who know about weak rotations or how you deal with Matsubara in many body physics, but it doesn't matter, okay? So, so let's just use it as a substitution. Now let's, I'm going to put in i beta up here. What happens? Well, I get the trace of u dagger, okay, e to the minus beta h of lambda tau, okay, u, e, I can just do on the board if you want, I mean, it's fine. But maybe. <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, everybody is following what I'm doing. I'm substitu substituting in i times beta into this expression. I have 4% to get this thing done to prove. Yeah. The problem is that you've completely crashed my iPad now, Mirko. <laughs> it's okay, we have time. No, this is it. You've broke my iPad with this thing. Uh, okay. So I have to share the. Yep. All right. We're now we're back in business. Okay. So. Get the landscape. <laughs> okay, so we're going to substitute in i times beta. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't seem to like this way of doing things, but it's okay. Um, so I get an e beta h of lambda zero, and then I get of course, the initial state, which is also thermal, e to the minus beta h lambda zero all over z of lambda zero. Does everybody follow? I've just substituted in i times beta. Okay? Everyone cool? You can cancel this with this, right? And now you're left with the trace of u dagger e to the minus beta h lambda of tau, okay, u, yeah, all over z0. Yeah, cycle the trace, pull the unitary in there, it goes away, yeah? So I'm left with um, the trace of e to the minus beta h lambda tau all over z lambda zero, and of course recognize now that what's on the numerator is precisely the partition function of the final thermal state, okay? So this is equal to z at lambda tau all over z i, okay, I'm using notation, but it doesn't matter, okay? Which is equal to the exponentiated free energy difference. So what, what have we proved with this thing from the characteristic function? We've proved Jarzinski. Equality, which is a very refined version of the second law, which says e to the minus beta w, which is the integral, remember, p of w, e to the minus beta w, yeah, is equal to e to the minus beta delta f. This was in a famous PRL around 97 by Jarzinski in the classical case, okay? Kirshen and Tasaki generalized this thing to quantum mechanical systems in early 2000, something like this, okay? And what does it mean, okay, is the next question. So um, remember that 
you know, delta f is just a number, right? So I could write this thing as uh, e to the minus beta, this, this isothermal dissipation is equal to one. You agree? Because I just bring in e to the minus beta delta f, why not? And uh, this thing is e to the minus big sigma is equal to one. Okay, this is now. Can we get to the standard second law from this, okay? Which would be just the average work must be greater than the or equal to the free energy difference. And, um, well, let me comment on something first, why, why this is interesting, yeah? So think about what we've done here, right? What, we, what, 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 what we've done here is remember that the work distribution yeah, no matter how you go from lambda zero to lambda tau, you'll generate a different unitary, different work statistics, etc. But it's telling you that if you can measure the exponentiated work, you can infer a thermal equilibrium property, namely delta F. So you can infer what the isothermal process is without ever doing an isothermal process, and that's independent of how you go from lambda zero to lambda tau. Yeah. So this was discovered by Jarzinski, who was analyzing the data from molecule pulling experiments, right? So from RNA folding and unfolding, you know, there was, it was, for the chemist, it was very interesting for them to be able to estimate the free energy, yeah? Which this, equ this equality allows you to do. Furthermore, why they say it uh, encodes the second law is you can apply something called Jensen's inequality Okay, so basically, uh, if x is a random quantity, so described by some distribution f of x, just like work now, okay, work is a random variable described by the probability distribution p of w, and a function f of x is convex, then Jensen's inequality says the average of the function of the random variable x, okay, is always greater than equal to the function of the average of x, okay? So you're just gonna apply Jensen's inequality now to Jarzinski's equality, okay? And you can easily see, you get e to the minus beta delta f, okay? Is equal to e to the minus beta w, okay? And that's greater than equal to e to the minus beta average w, okay? Take the log of both sides, okay? And you're left with Basically, minus beta delta F is greater than equal to minus beta um, average W, okay? And hence, beta average work minus delta F greater than or equal to zero. Second law, okay? From the Zerzinski equality. So I started from defining the work distribution. We did a Manipulation, move to I beta, okay, into the, if you want, the imaginary temperature axis, okay? And from the characteristic function, we proved Jarzinski equality, and then you apply Jensen's inequality for convex functions of a random variable, and you recover, essentially, the dissipation on average must be positive. What else does the equality tell you? It tells you that in any given experimental run, okay, you can find instances where the dissipation can be negative on a single run. So the stochastic variable that you measure can be, you know, can be negative. But these events, yeah, become exponentially rare as you, incre as you increase the temperature, okay? And on average, the dissipation is always positive. So it's a very refined version of the second law, okay? All right, I'm nearly done. Maybe for homework, um, just so you have something to try out yourself. Consider the following situation. You take an initial Hamiltonian, which is the harmonic oscillator, um, with some energies, uh, well, whatever, um, n plus a half, something like this. And then you're gonna do a sudden quench. 
So you just suddenly turn on an interaction potential that has some form like lambda a0 over root 2 uh, a dagger plus a. So a0 is just the 1 over square root of m times this thing, OK? What's interesting about sudden quenches, many people are interested in quenches for many body systems because that's the type of manipulation that they do, say, in ultra cold atoms, in ion traps, they do it very easily. So that means you very abru abruptly turn on a potential and you can measure the work statistics, OK? So what I ask you to try yourself to get familiarized with this formalism is work out the characteristic function for this problem, which is just the sudden displacement of an oscillator, okay? And then verify the Dzerzhinsky equality and show that it's independent of the, the quench amplitude, okay? That you always have the Dzerzhinsky equality. That's the exercise that's worth trying. And of course, many other interesting things emerge when you start to do many body physics and you do quenches and this type of thing, okay? The last thing I want to tell you about is, um, well, let's, I think it's good to finish on this because it's connected to relative entropy again, which is a more, for historical reasons, the Zerzhinsky equality was, it's called an integral fluctuation theorem, and then there's also detailed fluctuation theorems, and you can find them in all different types of contests, con contexts, ranging from steady states to all of that kind of thing, right? Different situations. The detailed fluctuation theorem which corresponds to the integral fluctuation theorem, which is the Dzerzhinsky equality, is called the Tesaki-Crookes relation, okay? Tesaki-Crookes relation, let me motivate what it looks like, right? So it's a scenario like this. You again have this situation where you're going between, um, you know, rho of lambda tau in thermal equilibrium and rho of lambda zero in thermal equilibrium. And you do your unitary up here, okay? You get some state sigma, which is u uh, rho lambda zero you dagger. But now what you're going to do is you're going to consider, okay, we're going to consider Hamiltonians which are, time sorry, time reversal uh, invariant, okay? So there's no stray magnetic field around the face or anything like this, just complicated things. So you're going to perform the inverse, the time reversed protocol, okay? Which in this case would just be you dagger, okay? But starting from here, you start in thermal equilibrium at the final point in parameter space, and you do the reverse. Yeah? Is that clear? So you're going to get work statistics that we've just shown how to compute for this in the forward direction, let's call it the forward direction. And then you're going to be able to compute the backwards work statistics, so the work statistics of the inverse protocol. Okay? Starting now in thermal equilibrium at the final point, doing the reverse, the Tesaki Crookes detail fluctuation theor theorem, okay, states it says the following, okay, let me just state it. PF of W over PB of minus W is equal to E to the beta. W minus delta F. Actually, the Dzerzhinsky equality is a corollary of this, okay? It's a few lines. So what does it mean, the Tesaki-Crookes relation, because now we're approaching five minutes to go? Um, what does it mean? Well, take the log of both sides of that equality, the Tesaki-Crookes relation, okay? You're gonna take the log of both sides, you get beta W minus delta F, so W now is the stochastic variable, okay? Is equal to log of PF of W um, over PB of minus W, the reversed protocol, right? Now I'm going to integrate both sides over the forward distribution, okay? So I'm going to integrate PF of W, DW, this guy, integral of PF of W, DW, okay? So notice that, well, delta F is just a number. So this gives you beta times the average work, because the integral of PF of W, W is the average work, okay? Minus delta F, because then you just get a term which is the integral of PF of W and its norm.
it tells you that the dissipation in the, or the entropy production in the forward distribution can be seen as the distinguishability between the work statistics, the distribution of work in that direction, and the corresponding time reverse process starting in the final equilibrium state. So, for example, if you can't distinguish the, path, the, the forward thing from the backward thing, imagine running a, a movie in reverse of your, of your protocol, if you can't distinguish those two things, then the entry production is zero. So you see there's a sort of intrinsic, intrinsic notion of um, asymmetry there as quantified by the classical relative entropy. Okay? So this is another manifestation of the second law and how relative entropy um, impinges on, 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 on that. Right? So I think I'll finish there. I think we've done enough. It's been a long few hours. Um, I hope it was somehow interesting for you and if you don't know any of this stuff that it's a good starting point um, for future studies, etc. As I said, the fluctuation theorems they come in many different guises and formats. By an extra hour, you can do this thing from the perspective of completely positive and trace preserving maps when you don't have unitary evolutions. You can see the role of certain channel characteristics. They exist also for currents, um, for steady states. So they are the most sophisticated versions of the second law that we know, and they tell us essentially that dissipation is constrained by fluctuations independently of any sort of order of linear responsive perturbation theory. So they are they hold arbitrarily far from the theory. Okay. So that's the population theorems and let's leave the, the lecture with that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so lunch now we'll head downstairs.